Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. I'm joined today by a Canadian infantry combat veteran who spent three weeks in a coma in a U.S. military hospital in Germany with no fewer than 47 broken bones in his body. He's a past director of Wounded Warriors Canada and a passionate advocate for soldiers facing physical and mental health challenges. He's an avid sports shooter and hunter and now works with Stoker Canada and Beretta Defense Technologies, getting next generation weapons and technology to our soldiers. Welcome to the Silver Corps podcast, David McDonald. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to come on to the podcast and yeah, happy to answer any questions or talk whatever you want. Well, I'm stoked. You know, well, I guess first off, how was your flight in? Flight was fine. Uh, they said we we're going to hit turbulence and it never really happened. So I, I can't complain. Um, I'm always thrown off a little bit that it takes from where I live, uh, you know, near where I'm flying out of Toronto. I don't yep. live just outside Toronto or like that. The time it takes to fly from heat from Toronto to Vancouver is basically the exact same distance. It goes from, to, from Toronto to London, England. So, you know, I know it's, uh, <laughs> it's crazy. Man, it's probably cheaper to fly to London, isn't uh, it? It is. My sister lives there and I see her about three times a year <laughs> and it is cheaper to fly there than it is to Vancouver, but, uh. You're saying you might've had a bit of a celebrity on the flight? Yeah, we were, we were, you know, me, uh, my, me and my, uh, coworker were flying out here and we were boarding the plane and a couple of seats back from us and I, I, I get on the plane and I'm like, is that Pierre Paul? Yeah, but, cause it, it looks a bit like him, but I didn't want to be the guy to be like, call him out, but kind of had to or anything like that. It looked like he was, you know, talking <laughs> to someone and I was just like, Hey Pierre. And he turns around and he's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. It is him. Or it like is that. Him. I'm like, I, I just didn't think, you know, the leader of the opposition was going to be flying economy WestJet out to, uh, out to, uh, Vancouver. But yeah, it was, uh, it was cool to see him. Um, you know, he sat there and talked to a whole bunch of people and stuff like that. Then he went to the back of the plane and, you know, was doing, I guess, some stuff with his team, but, uh, Did his thing. but uh, it was just really cool, you know, it, not to see, I guess to see him on a commercial flight and not taking like a you know, government Airbus or, cause I'm sure that's available to him. So. Yeah. 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 It's, you know, it's, I'm sure it's all part of it, but I mean, he's got a choice and yeah. some people choose not to. And I, I've, I've taken, I was lucky enough to actually fly one of those government Airbuses one time back from Alberta from a uh, Miltrex and uh, they're, they're, they are comfortable. So yeah, uh, I believe they would be. It's a little, it's definitely better than flying economy WestJet. Not that anything's going bad against WestJet, but, uh, it's a little more spacious on those government, uh provided uh, contract flights, but. That's funny. You know, I, uh, recently I was talking with a friend of mine and he's, uh, moved up to the Soyuz area and he was asked to run as uh, mayor up there and he's a uh, big advocate, advocate in the firearms community and he's got a firearms business. People could probably figure it out just by the information I'm given here. And, uh, I, he's involved with his local range and there, he gets a contact saying, Hey, we've got a, um, uh, someone who wants to come into the range, it's, it's Pierre. He'd want to come to the range and talk to some people there. And so I guess he's part of the, uh, the process going around looking for places that, uh, he needs to drum up more support. And, mm-hmm. um, so my buddy missed by a narrow margin of getting elected in, but this reporter just did an absolute smear job on him uh, a couple of times. And right. even after he missed it, the reporter comes in and makes, he's just like, it was Anyone can look it up. They can see it. It's pretty self-evident for what it is. Um, just making broad allegations and nothing of it's true. And so my buddy's sitting there and he's, you know, pretty, pretty upset about this, but he didn't do anything about it. And he probably had grounds to do something about Mm. it, but uh, he's of the mindset that the universe will unfold as it should. Yeah. Well, Pierre is coming up. And so he's like, well, just, you know, Pierre, got to let you know through, through your, uh, people to you. Uh, there is a reporter up here who's not going to be friendly. Uh, and, uh, here's what happened to me, you know, just, you know, 
comport yourself accordingly. Just here's a bit of a bit of a heads up. Anyways, so Pierre comes up, does his thing, and I don't know if it's common practice or not, or if it was because my buddy gave him the the specific heads up on this event, but they made sure to have their cameras rolling as this guy, the reporter, came in to do his uh, interview with them, and he starts going down this similar kind of poor reporting tactic. Right. And uh there's Pierre in a vineyard chewing on an apple. Oh, talking. okay. That, that, the famous <laughs> you got interview. It. Yeah. The yeah. famous interview. Yeah. How do you like them apples? <laughs> and, uh, so anyways, my buddy's like, it, it's true. I didn't do anything. The universe course yeah. corrected. It came about, this guy's name is mud. Now everyone can see him for what he is. Yeah. And it's, uh, it is interesting. It's nice. What goes around, comes around in a way that's, I, I guess, positive and. and yeah. Well, I, I mean, and I, I've, I've been in interviews with media before where, you know, generally they're, you know, generally they are respectable or something like that, especially when we're talking about, and whenever there was an incident that occurred for, mm. you know, before we pulled out of Afghanistan or when we had troops in Iraq, for whatever reason, when I, especially when I was with the charity, I, I was like on the number one call list for let's call this guy to get his opinion sure. on what happened or something like that. And, um, and I was always kind of like, well, I'm not saying anything until obviously until it's been cleared by the army. I'm still in the army at this point for a fair amount of it. And I got to, you know, cause Mainly because I didn't want to say anything or speak out of turn before the families had been notified or something. Right. That's, it has to be done that way. I'm, resp- you know, that's important. Yep. But I, yeah, I've sat in interviews before where the the reporter clearly wanted to go a certain way. Yeah. And I just would not give it to them. <laughs> and those are always the interviews I found that surprisingly they never aired at six o'clock. They were just kind of like, yeah, we're going to quash that story because they just wouldn't, he just wouldn't give us what we wanted, you know, him to say it and. Uh, we're all trained in the army with media awareness, mm. um, but uh, I was lucky enough that I also had some added experience, and I had some, I, 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 I had a some previous uh, little, I, you know, I pulled a doozy here or there um, mm. in past interviews. I, I, uh, I got in a little bit of trouble with my army unit for the public affairs in Ottawa because after the. Uh, uh, after the attack that happened in, auto, in at Parliament, uh, where the uh, Nathan Cirillo enforcement mm. was killed, uh, again I would find myself in front of a camera with the CBC and Global, and I think it was the Global interview. They caught me. I was at work. I was working at the T- at TD Bank at the time, actually, or something mm. like that. And uh, they, I was a little emotional because just everything was sure. going on. And uh, I think I publicly called out ISIS. To, this is my address. This is my home. You're feel free to come. And you know, and mm-hmm. talk to me anytime you want or anything like that. And got a little bit of trouble for that. But, uh, at the exact same time, you know, it's already out there. What are you going to do? But, uh. Yeah. But, yeah, <laughs> but you know what? I, did they I, hear that? Yeah, they did. And really? I, I, I became known in, uh, amongst the army units in Toronto as the guy that called out ISIS and, and told them exactly where Good I live you. and come join. Come, you feel free to come by whenever you want. Yeah, maybe like come that, by right? at night. Maybe they feel yeah. a little braver. <laughs> but, by all uh, means. But yeah, you learn that, you know, you can't let emo- ever let emotion get into it. The exact same way that interview that, uh, that Pierre did. It's not, it's not about that. It's about, you know, staying the point of your, your, your message or anything like that and, and being respectful, most important of all, or anything like that. I think that's really the key factor there. And even if the reporter clearly, it doesn't really want to be, or wants mm. you to do a certain way, you, you kind of have to keep on message, right? So. Yeah, I remember, you know, oftentimes I'll get phone calls from, from media cause I've been in media in the past mm-hmm. and they want an opinion on something. And, I, uh, I think the first one I did was CBC was, I was in my twenties and, um, man, cameras were on, the reporter was there. They're, I'm talking about everything I know, which is well within my wheelhouse. And then he asks me a question. I forget what it was. And I had no clue what the answer is. And the correct answer should have been, I don't know. Yeah. Right. But the cameras are on, you're up there. I'm like, well, it could be. And I was sitting here speculating. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of times we can be our own worst enemies when we do that. You having media training with the military, I think is fantastic. I think as, uh, let's say firearms owners or hunters or, uh, people who are going to be talking to the media should at least get on Google and look up yeah. or AI, Hey, well, how should I approach this? Cause it's a business deal. It's a transaction. They exactly. want something. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, I, I found I, a friend of mine, he's in, uh, he works for the, uh, provincial government and he says, you know, the whole thing is a business deal. Uh, ask him ahead of time. What is it you're trying to achieve? What would you like to see? And if it doesn't align with yours. That's easy. It's an easy answer for you, right? Yeah. You're out. Yeah. 
But yeah, as you said, I mean, the best thing you do is say, I, I'm sorry, I don't know that answer, but you can, I, I'll refer you to this person. They may be able to, you know, ref- um, and I don't know what it is about being in the army. Whenever there's a report around, they always seem to catch you right when you're in the, when you're coming out of the field, right after like just a bag drive of a exercise or a training event. And first time, actually the first time I ever got in any media event whatsoever was actually, I got into a stars and stripes article. Okay. Uh, I was down in, we were down in Texas doing yep. some cross training and, uh, we were getting ready to go overseas on my first tour and it was, uh, there just happened to be a Stars and Stripes reporter reporting that, you know, there's Canadians down here. What if, I guess it was big news that, you know, we were down there and we were actually, America finally realized that, you know, Canada had deployed, was deploying troops with Americans into Afghanistan yep. like that. So, uh. <laughs> Uh, so they tried to interview a couple of us and it was well before the public affairs officer could get out to the, you know, to the, the desert range where we were at. And we had just been hiking for up in the mountains around the El Paso area for probably like, you know, eight hours. We we're coming off the, you know, the mountain range and that's when the reporter was in my face and I'm, it, it was handled well, but yeah, it was just like, you know, of course you're catching us all at the worst time possible. At the time I was like a young corporal, just like God in my stripes and it was just like, it Looking back now, I'm like, yeah, I, I could have done better at that interview, but eh, what are you going to do, right? Like, it's a learning experience. As long as we treat it like that. I mean, yeah. there's all these things like late at night, you wake up, I'm like, I should have said this. Yeah, I should have yeah, done yeah. that, right? Yeah. And uh, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> right, I probably shouldn't have. Those are the worst, right? Yeah. Um, but as long as we can look at it as a learning experience and actually learn from mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Uh, that, that's kind of how I get over kicking myself yeah. in the butt too hard. And, and that's really anything in life, you know, yeah. like I've, I've made a lot of mistakes and I'm sure we'll get into some on the podcast today or like that. And, uh, <laughs> but I, like I said, as long as it's, you learn something from it, you know, it's not really truly a failure. Yeah. Well, you know, you, yeah. <laughs> we're talking a little bit off air here mm-hmm. about, um, I think I use Brad Brooks as an example and, uh, Brad, he owns our galley and he's makes tents and trekking poles and he's a climber. He makes this lightweight gear and it's fantastic hunting gear. And my first podcast I did with him, I'm researching all the gear because I figured we're going to want to talk about gear and everyone's going to want to hear about gear. And he, I get ready to record and he says, okay, Trav, this is your podcast. You do what you want, but if you don't mind. I'm so sick and tired of talking about gear. <laughs> can, can, can we talk about the passion of the hunt? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and that was what he was passionate about at the time. And so that was a big learning thing for me. What is a person passionate about at the time? Now you've, like you're saying before, your story, you've told it a fair number of times. It's an important story. It's a, it's a good story. Love to hear it on the podcast, but if it's not something that you're passionate about, we can talk about other things too. Yeah. Uh, no, you know what? I, I'm, I'm happy sharing my story. Um, I think it's an, it's an important, it, it's definitely an important, you know, uh, story and my, it's an important to show you kind of how I progressed to where I am now or like that. And what also th- still the challenges that face, you know, that I face on a daily basis today. I think it's really important that now I, you know, I'll say this ahead of time. I, I've also, I've, I've seen some of your podcasts. I've seen some of the other people on it. Uh, just recently this morning, I was watching the one officer down with the RCMP mm. officer and it's funny. It was actually giving me kind of chills, but his story is no different from in terms of, you know, what he, not what the trauma that he experienced mm. and the reason and the, the thing that caused it, but all the things that came after. I'm like, yep, I did all that. Mm. It, it's a cycle. It's the same kind of thing that happens to every single person or like that. It happens at different times in different ways and things like that. But I was just like, yeah, that all sounds kind of familiar. Uh, the destructive pattern you kind of go down and then pulling yourself back and it, something occurred or some sort of incident occurred that allows you to kind of be like, okay, I got to stop doing what I'm doing and I got to get mm-hmm. my head straight on. Uh, but I know I'm happy to share, uh, parts of my story. I'm happy to share, you know, the whole thing, as you mentioned. So when I, was getting into the veterans help space. I was extremely passionate about it. Mm. Uh, I realized that I wasn't alone, you know, for a long time there, I felt completely alone. I thought, you know, they'd given us all the briefings ahead of time before it's where you could experience this. And PTSD is a real thing. At this point it was 2007 and they, it was good enough that they were like, oh yeah, this could all happen. But then again, when you look back, I'm like, yeah, that was an, that was a half hour lecture we had right. in a 10 month workup training. <laughs> right. And it was happening at like two o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. And we're like, when are we getting out of here yep. so we can go home? Like, like you weren't really, you weren't paying attention. No. Right. So, uh, it's, and you know, when I deployed the first time, I think I was 23 years old 
maybe maybe 22 you're invincible right you're you're, you're oh, not yeah. you're not worried about i remember when i was 22 yeah, yeah. you're 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 not worried about all the mental trauma that your tour could cause or anything like that you're all you're concerned about you're not even really concerned about dying i i i wasn't actually concerned the only time i actually at all thought about, oh crap, I actually might die. I'm sorry if I, I don't know if I can swear on this or anything like that, but uh, swear if, it comes away. Out, if it comes out, I 15 years <laughs> in the infantry, man, it, 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 it almost happens. I came out yeah. to catch myself now with my son because I'm like, he's going to say something mm-hmm. these days at daycare and I'm going to get in trouble. But, you will. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, you're not thinking of, the only time I thought at all that, oh crap, I actually might die here was actually the plane ride into Afghanistan. That's so, it, eh? Yeah. Up until that point, I was just like the worst fear I had and the worst fear I had on tour was I may do something that may kill one of my buddies, Mm -hmm. one of my platoon mates. I may not see something. I may miss something or anything like that. That's what I was concerned about. Mm. You weren't concerned about, you know, every time you left the wire, you're rolling out. Yeah. You said I had a little ritual where I said a little, I'm not really a a religious person. Uh, There are no atheists in foxholes. Yeah. Yeah. But I said a little (laughs) prayer to God. I'd be like, bring me back. And it always seemed to work. Mm -hmm. Until it, until it didn't, but, uh, but there was a little, you know, moment there, but that was it. And then it was just, okay, let's go. It's mission time. And, uh, so when you're, when it actually does happen and the incident occurs and then you start having all these challenges at home, you know, both physically, but also mentally, you just feel completely alone. You don't, you don't remember the lecture you had, you know, Mm. a year or two ago or like that. Then this could, oh, this could happen to you. And, uh, so when you finally, what do you feel triggered at? What do you feel was a, uh, so in, initially, um, and I, I, when I talk to school kids, cause I still do occasionally have school, uh, I, I like doing, going out and talking to, you know, both school, all, all age groups from like, you know, public school all the way up to high school. Uh, the initial trigger for me, and as I like to, and I say this because we'll get to that in a second, but I like to say it is that it was a, uh. It was firecrackers initially. Mm. Totally makes sense. Mm. Of course. Explosions. My job overseas was, I, I had, let me preface, I had one, probably one of the best jobs you could have. I know people have probably said that before. As a infantry reservist <laughs> deploying in a combat arms role, I had probably one of the best jobs you could have overseas. Okay. I was force protection. Okay. So we went out and, and did all, all the security for all the supply convoys. So I got to live at CAF. With all the luxuries of calf, <laughs> but I got to go outside the wire and go out to the fobs and go out to all the cops and the outposts every, every day. Mm. So I got to see the countryside more than even the infantry guys did because they had their little areas of operation. I got to go to every single area of operation they had from all the way up in the north down to the south. We even went off into the furthest kind of U.S. base where we had a Canadian artillery station at. And, uh, so you got to see a lot of the country. You... You know, we had a lot of potential to get into contacts. Um, we didn't really see too many, mm-hmm. which we were, you know, good or bad, depending on who you talk to. But sure. Uh, and, that, and that builds too, right? Yeah. Every time you yeah. go out, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Oh, and- absolutely. Like the, the stress and, you know, on that was, and then my, you know, and then I like to say like my job was, was I had fun. I thought I was, I had, I had the greatest job within force protection is that I was just, that was a rifleman dismount. So mm. I wasn't a driver. I wasn't a gunner. I was a backup gunner for the vehicle, but my job was to get driven around. Well, you get driven around, but it, and I, I tell this to my civilian friends and they look at me like, I'm absolutely just, you know, are, are you nuts? Like, uh, cause when I say I was a human bomb detector, mm. it, 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 that's literally the best description I could give you is what it, my job was, is that we're driving the, down, down the road. We were in these, the, the RG 31 Nile as they had got for us at this point. So a vehicle specifically designed to roll over an IED and have it blow up underneath it or mm-hmm. like that for survivability of the crew. But, you know, they cost more than the average, than, the, than my life does or anything like that. So, uh. Huh, well, I guess who's, depending on who's doing the accounting. Depending on who's doing it, yeah. But, uh, but anyway, so we're driving down the road. My job was to get out of the perfectly good mine resistant vehicle. If we had a little, if we had any sort of, you know, idea of there might be something up, up, you know, in front of it and go walk with my team and do vehicle checkpoints uh, well, the vulnerable, vulnerable checkpoints and search for IEDs mm. ahead of it. So the convoys are back here. We're about, you know, up to a, you know, a kilometer in front of it, searching around, uh, looking for, you know, anything that looks at a place. And I remember when I first landed in theater, they were like, oh, you know, look for like garbage. Okay. Look for, look, look for garbage. Cause that's a good place they have to put IEDs and look for, 
yellow containers, the yellow plastic containers, because that's what they mm -hmm. like using homemade explosives with. And then you actually get outside the wire and you're like, there's garbage everywhere. <laughs> And the main thing they use to transport everything in this country yellow. is yellow plastic containers. Yep. So I'm like, great. This is look look, look for <laughs> look for low riding Toyotas and Corollas. You're like, okay, well, what the taxis Everywhere. or ev like you know like all of them because all of them are you know from the you know 1980s or 70s and all the, all the suspension is shot on them. So you're like, <laughs> okay, so this is going to be an easy job, right? But, right, right. But you got the uh, really interact. You really felt you were finally kind of like you know you felt like you're doing something over there. And we went out ahead of the mine clearance crews that went out to the road clearance every morning. So we were out ahead of that. So the time they rolled, we already cleared the road by the time they rolled up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they were like, oh, you had metal detectors? You had dogs with you? No, we didn't have any of that. It was literally step, step, step. Uh, nothing blew up. I guess we can keep going or something. Mm. And sticking, sticking your head inside culverts and, you know, your body looked to, with a flashlight to look for, you know, where was in there. Not that we knew how to diffuse it. Our job was just to find it. Right. So, and if we found something, then you're calling the combat engineers out and they're going to, you know, diffuse it for you. If you're lucky enough, you have, might have an engineer with you that could do it. But, uh, but still, I, I, I thought it was the greatest job you could have. We weren't stuck sure. at an outpost for eight months. Yeah. We got to do that thing and then come back and have a, you know, a pizza back at CAF. Like, well, 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 you got good food, you got, yeah. Got and, and, and I think overall we had the respect of a lot of the you know, right force battalions that were out of the fobs because, you know, we were still at least infantry doing the job, getting their supplies. We always made sure that if we're going out to like Spur or Wilson or Matt or, you know, or Frontenac or whatever it is, well, we're going to make sure we load up on pizzas for the boys and bring them out to them or like that because mm -hmm. it's the least we could do, right? Um, but anyway, so that, needless to say, the stress of that, you're not thinking at the time, that's building up. Sure. There'd be a lot of stress. Oh there. yeah. Yeah. And you're, uh, you're just, you know, you're just doing this day in, day out, you know, and you're just count. Now you're not going out every day cause we have a, you know, a platoon of guys. Mm -hmm. So a patrol usually would run about three vehicles. We have nine vehicles in the platoon. So sometimes you're back at CAF doing other stuff, VIP protection, uh, POW protection. Cause mm -hmm. you can't have a high value Taliban prisoner at the hospital. Because any of the Afghans that work there, sure, they're going to try to kill yep. them or like that. So yep. your job is to protect, but your own, you know, you're a little conflicted about it too, because you're like, this guy probably just tried to kill me not that long ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a tough moral, is ethical what it, thing. It's what it is. But yep. you do escorts for the local Afghans that work on camp and things like that. Or, or, and we were QRF for the, for the CAF as well. So if mm -hmm. the base ever came under attack, it did not on our tour, but in a later tour in 20, 2010, it, it did. I wasn't there at the time, mm -hmm. uh, but- uh, I had a bunch of friends that were from my, actually my reserve unit that was over there at that time. And so they had to fight off an attack at CAF, which sounds like, Ugh, but actually for all of us, we're like, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> you get to do something cool. Like, uh, again, it's the, it's a weird mentality, but like, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's a soldier's mentality. Right. So, right. uh, but so anyway, fast forward, you know, you go from high speed unit doing that kind of work or like that, which, you know, somebody some may say it's not a high speed, you know, job, but it doesn't really matter sure. you know, in terms of this podcast. I've, it yeah. felt like we were doing something really, really, you know, valuable and cool and we were involved or, and we did a bunch of multinational operations as well with the Brits and the Aussies and things and, uh, and like Royal Marine commandos and stuff like that, which, you know, you cool. wouldn't think we'd be able to, right? Yeah. And then you, it all comes to a screeching halt. <sighs> what happened? So I, I can't tell you the exact thing that happened that day. Cause I have no memory of it. Mm. Uh, it was late in the tour. Uh, so our, our tour, we called it the never ending story. Okay. <laughs> Tours for Canadians usually lasted six months long. <laughs> workup training usually was six months long. Our workup training was just over a year. Cause at this time in around 2007, the reg force had already been deployed to Afghanistan since 20, uh, uh 2002. Mm. You had guys with multiple tours. They were just getting tired. They were releasing, they were getting out. And there was a recruitment problem, even the same way it is now, but there was a mm -hmm. recruitment problem at the time. And so they thought, we have a great resource. We'll, we'll pull reservists up and they'll fill backfill the spots in the Reg Force battalions. And we'll, and we were all on board because we're getting, you know, extra pay. Sure. It was, you know, a good chance for us to work with the Reg Force units. That extra time, I really think actually set us up well because it allowed us to really, really meld with them, but also gain their respect because- mm. Uh, it, it, 
when we first landed, there wasn't a huge amount of uh, uh, respect between. There was a professional camaraderie, you know, sure. like, but it was a little. Yeah, the first couple of weeks were a little uh, tough to uh, to get through, but uh, so anyway, so uh, we we deployed. We did our first six months. I didn't even get my HLTA until six and a half months into the tour. Mm. When we were getting, when we were thinking, okay, it's time for us to rip out. We were told, well, your your replacement coming in, they're not ready yet. They've been deemed that they need additional training in Canada. Okay. So you're all here. You've all been voluntold for, you're going to be here for an additional three to four months. We didn't care. Sure. We're like, great, cool. Second, second bar, you know, a a bar on the tour uh, medal and more pay for us. Mm -hmm. Really, it came down to great, more three months additional pay, like with danger pay, tax free. Hell yeah. Like we're. Beauty. We're all young and the ones that aren't, they all have mortgages and they're like, I got to pay that off or I got a kid (laughs) in college that, you know, like. Yeah. So, so. Went on my leave, came home, came back to, you know, went, came back into the theater like that. And I was there for maybe a month. Um, went into orders that, that morning that we were going to go out and do the standard, what we called the milk run, which was a, 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 mo- a supply moved from what we call the CLP, not the, the oil. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm almost sure that was on one of the trucks, but we were going to move. Uh, Clean loop protect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, combat logistic patrol is what we yeah. call it. So a CLP and we we're going to go from CAF. To Massimgar, I think it was to Wilson and possibly um, what, down to Spur went and back. Mm. One day run, something we were doing, you know, we called the milk run because it's something we we did so often that it became kind of, and it was through Kandar City, and uh, but through the Panjaway district, mm. like, like center, like that, which is you know, a bit of a Taliban hotbed. But, and uh, so we were going through orders that morning. Uh, I was deemed a team medic actually, cause I was a, I was teachable C qualified and we didn't have any other medics going out with, uh, with us that day. Medics were a hot commodity on my tour. They really didn't have, there wasn't enough of them to go around. So, so like, Oh, Max, you know, Mac, you're the team medic. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's, I was really on board with that. I sure. like, I like doing the medical stuff and, uh, I was probably the most experienced medic on uh, outside of civilian world or anything like that. Like when, cause I'd been involved in a couple of mass casualty situations on the tour and things like that. Uh, so anyway, the last thing I remember is that rolling out up outside the wire in my vehicle, we were lead vehicle out that night, that morning. Next thing I remember, I'm waking up three weeks later in a hospital in Germany. <laughs> That's going to be an odd feeling. Oh, you're waking up another continent away. Yeah. In a clean, first of all, I knew I wasn't in Afghanistan anymore. Cause I'm in a clean white room. When you're waking up, what were well, you that, thinking? That didn't happen. I, you know, that no sand anywhere, no dirt, nothing. Right. Right. And I'm like, uh. Okay. This is weird. Yeah. What was going through your head? First thing through my head is, uh, honestly, it was, I, I, you know, did I, are my legs still there? Mm. We had a kind of a growing, we had, we had a kind of thing like, oh, if you're, if you're sent to Germany, you've lost, you know, you've lost an appendage. Like you, mm. your leg, arm was gone. So, uh, I remember the nurse came in and, you know, they saw that I was awake and stuff like that. So they came in and they were trying to explain what was going on or something like that. And so like, you woke up without anybody around you? No, yeah. Nothing, nobody around me. You like just kind of started opening your eyes. Open my eyes things, up. And things I'm are like, focusing. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, hold on. Where am I? Right. Mm. Nurse runs in and she's like, oh, you know, try to explain. You were, you were involved in an incident. You know, you're, you're okay, but you 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 are hurt. You're in Germany. I'm like, oh, once I heard Germany, I'm like, oh, Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know, do I have my legs? She's like, yeah, yeah, you're, no, your legs are good. And I'm like, oh, okay. Wait, mm-hmm. do I have, do I have my arms? Mm-hmm. Cause I, at this point I'm on so much morphine. I can't feel anything below my neck. <laughs> mm-hmm. And being 23, rather than ask if I'm paralyzed or anything like that, I'm wondering about my legs, and my arms. <laughs> What's the third question? Yeah. You know what the third <laughs> question is going to be? I asked like, you know, is everything still good down there? Yeah. And she took a look and I thought she took way too long to tell me. She's like, yeah, everything's where it's supposed to be. I'm like, oh, thank God. Okay. And, uh, so then it kind of, you know, over the next couple of days, they explained to me, you know, like, you know, this is what's happened. You were involved in a, in a, in an accident. It was a, it wasn't, the official report is that it wasn't due to enemy action. It wasn't due to combat. It was a vehicle accident, a Afghan Corolla, uh, drove, tried to drive into our vehicle and our, our, we were going to go clear a bridge. It'll be clear just outside of Canada, the Kandahar city bridge, uh, between CAF and, Can- and the outskirts of Kandahar city. Mm. Uh, and 
we cleared this bridge probably 90 times before or something like that, you know, something like that, right? You know, and we were in the lead vehicle. We went to go clear the bridge ahead of it against the rest of the convoy. So we would drive across the entire thing and then set up a, you know, a, a security point on the other side. Somewhere between that area, between when we get to the other side, a vehicle drove out and almost hit our vehicle. So we swerved, but we were going so fast at this point. Our vehicles are top heavy. Mm -hmm. It started to roll and it just rolled. <laughs> and it didn't stop rolling for about a, like a hundred feet. Ooh. So everything in the vehicle that's packed in the vehicle happens to be packed right near me. <laughs> mm. So everything, all the bags and everything is, even though they're secured, they're ripping out or like that. And it's just all falling on top of me. It's like a my tumble dryer. Oh yeah. My machine gun slams me in the face. Mm. Um, apparently I hit my head into the back of the glass of the RG with enough force to crack the glass. And that's, Bulletproof resistant glass resistance of 50 cals. Now it, it will still crack if you shoot it, right? Sure. But, so what exact force that was, who knows? But it was enough to crack the glass and flatten my helmet. Mm. Uh, and uh, that led to me having a skull fracture that pretty much went from my back of my neck all the way up to my front, my left orbital, orbital bone right here. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, led to the coma and everything else that was going on, everything like that. And so waking up in Germany, yeah, that was... And then, you know, it, 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 hearing the, you know, getting the physical injuries out, but really, I think the more, the most traumatic part of that entire day was finding out that I was in Germany, my platoon was still in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and they still had a month left of their tour and I wasn't going back. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like these, these are got you know, men and women that I'd been with for two years at this point. Yeah, they were closer to me than my family in most cases. And mm -hmm. that'd be tough. Yeah. What about the other people, the other occupants of the vehicle? They got away okay. Yeah. Uh, it just happened to be that I just happened to be in the worst spot of the vehicle when this rolled over like that. And uh, the driver got out, the, the crew commander got out. The bat, my gunner hurt his back a bit, but he was, he managed to stay in theater. But I was just completely. I effed up. Uh, yeah. There was three no, weeks. Yeah. There was no walking away from that. Now, um, I had bleeding in the brain. Hmm. I, uh, I'd crushed every bone in my left hand or something like that. It's looking pretty good today, but it's been 12 years now. And, hmm. um, you're right handed well, to begin with. I'm right handed to begin with. So I didn't have to learn to do anything with my other <laughs> hand, which is good. But, um, yeah, like God, broke my, broke my pelvis, dislocated my left leg, hmm. had some uh, spinal fractures, um, Later in life, I find out, you know, during the incident, I also severed a nerve in my, in my leg or like that, that controls, doesn't hurt, but it controls, uh, four out of the five toes. So they just don't move. They in? don't move okay. at all. And actually they, they just, they, they just operate independently and they kind of just stay close together like that. So okay, it comes I guess with some balance issues here or there, but uh, it's just one of those things. You got uh, feeling there? Or? Yeah, I got feeling for okay. the most part. Okay. But it just, they just move as one. So it's almost like kind of like a flipper more than anything else. But, uh, <laughs> um, then as you find, as you find out things, you know, as you go on, but it, the, the bright side to it coming home, uh, and re the physical injuries, despite them being as much as they were, it, you know, young and got to say super fit. There's mm. nothing to do in Afghanistan other than, you know, play poker, Work out. Work out. Yeah. I was working out twice a day over there like that, right? And I'm at the point, you know, you're, you're almost Olympic level fitness. So mm -hmm. being that physically fit, you recover pretty quickly. It helps a lot. Uh, yeah. And that's, I'm, I'm learning today now that I'm 39, going to turn 40. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Even though the workouts aren't as intense as they once were, you got to keep it up because you it's, do. It's, it's, the injuries don't stop and that, and they're starting to rid their ugly heads here and there like that from past. So, uh. Well, that effort at the front end sure pays dividends oh, at yeah. the back end. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm a little more, a little more prone now to sit on the couch and eat a bag of chips <laughs> than I am to work, go to the gym. But, uh, but, uh, but so you recover quickly, but it, yeah, mentally though, the, I didn't realize the, you know, it took a couple of years for me to realize really what was going on mentally and. Did other were, people recognize it before you? You know, I think they did. But they were in denial just as much as I were. Um, and I mentioned before, uh, firecrackers. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and this is why I, I want to say that, you know, they just say that triggering, you know, everyone's triggers a little bit different. Everyone, you know, 
no mental health injury is the same. Although, as I said, when I lifted your officer up down podcast, I was just like, okay, all mm. that stuff that he did, I did as well. Yeah. That's Nathan it, Kepler. It's, yeah. It's a very, very, you know, everything I'm like, okay, did maybe a different way he did it, maybe different reasons or different, you know, but it's very, very similar. But it doesn't mean that the triggers are necessarily the same or even the way the trigger. So when I say, when I was telling kids, you know, I tell kids firecrackers, mm. everyone's like, yeah, of course the explosions. You, you worked with IEDs. You, you've had explosions happen around you. I was involved in rocket attacks and then overseas and I'm like, yeah, you know, I was, I spent a lot of time at Massimgar, which we called the catcher's mitt, which mm. was literally just a base with a, a big open end that faced Panja, the, uh, the city center. And there was always these great pots where they'd lob mortars in at us. And, but then I explained, well, what about the fireworks do you think triggers me? And everyone's like, well, the explosions. I'm like, no, it's that the explosions actually are a release for me. They're the calming effect mm. because over and when you're there, but if you heard the explosion, you survive. That's right. Hearing the launch, the little thunk of it leaving the tube. Mm. Oh, even yeah. now, like it, I'm, it sends some shivers down my can, spine. Yeah. Cause. All you could do was, you know, I remember there was one incident in Masking where we heard the thunk and you heard get down and there was nowhere to, oh, I was just, I was literally in the middle of going from my, uh, uh, ballistic hut up here down to where the, uh, logistics headquarters was, was getting some orders and like that. And I was stuck in the middle, just in this open flat area with nothing but gravel around you. And the only thing you do is get to the ground and hope you hear that explosion or mm-hmm. like that. And you know, I, you did and look, you know, I managed it, it, it hit on their side of the base and it didn't affect me, but it definitely stuck with you a little bit. Cause you're like, okay. In the moment when that happened, yeah. it isn't hit. Yeah. Adrenaline rush. Thinking, oh, Woo-hoo, massive. This was great. Yeah. Oh, and you're like, ha you, right. you, you missed me. <laughs> right, exactly. But, but at the exact same time, you, you, and again, you're young at the time, you don't realize what's going on, but it does definitely leave a scar in your head of kind of like, remember the thunk of the tube means you're, you're, you're going to die. Mm. The explosion is released. You just survived. So I remember, uh, one May 4th, one May, one May 2, 4 weekend, I was out with my girlfriend and we were down at, uh, we thought it'd be really smart to go down to, uh, after just Bay in Toronto, massive firework display. And I couldn't handle, I, I, I just, I retreated to the, like to the basement or anything like that. And, you know, and she didn't understand at all. She was, she got upset. Again, alcohol was involved. So of course, sure. you know, um, uh, and I was, Weirdly enough, I actually found the, the, the person we were visiting, her, her dad was down there and I was like, he was like, you okay? And I'm like, no, I don't think I am. And he's just like, yeah. And it turns out he was, he had been a, uh, a Vietnam vet mm. and he'd been one of the Canadians that served in Vietnam. And he's like, yeah, 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 don't worry. I get it. And I'm like, okay. So I felt kind of safe at that moment, but that was like kind of the first sign of, I remember I was crossing a field on another day. Same thing. Fireworks go off. And the first thing I do is I go to the, I'm like, I have groceries in my hand, throw them off and I go to the dirt. Mm. So there's like an explosion. And then I go booking it across the field and back home. I just leave the groceries there in the field. Yeah. And then I got home and I was, I, I was so confused because I'm like, why did I do that? I'm, I'm home. It makes sense at the time. Right, it makes though. sense completely. It's, it's, it's your body goes in, you know, the training kicks in and you immediately go into, uh, what, you know, survival mode. Mm. But then you get, you get, you think about it after a second, you're like, I'm home. There's, there's, there was no threat there. <laughs> um, trying to rationalize those things is, um, can be difficult though. And oh, you feel completely embarrassed. You well, felt, that, and that's yeah, it. Yeah. Right. I felt, I felt like a jackass. And then. And I think that's where people have difficulty. Yeah. And I, I think it exacerbates the issue because you're like, well, I shouldn't have done that. And I shouldn't have felt like this when the reality is how you're feeling and how you're reacting is a perfectly natural response Completely, to everything yeah. that's happening. Yeah. And yeah, I remember and my wife will kill me for this, but I remember years ago, you know, having an argument, I'm basically, I'm rashly trying to work through this and I'm like, it, this doesn't make sense, right? This is how your feeling doesn't make sense is essentially what I'm saying to yeah. her. And she's like, you're right but it doesn't change the fact that I feel like this. Yeah, so we, yeah, we need yeah. to address this, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. And I think that same sort of logic applies to a situation like this. Like, okay, maybe I can't rationalize it, but I'm still feeling it. I can recognize yeah. it. So let's address it. But also, and, and at, at the exact same time, I was just like, oh, well, this is just, this will probably go away. This is common. You just got back from tour not that long ago or anything like that. You know, you're just going through the motions of it. Because again, and this is where some of the lectures maybe the army taught us, kind of was actually the worst enemy mm. 
because, oh, this is, this is normal or like that. It'll go away. It's just like it'll a go muscle, away. muscle yeah, injury. It'll go away. A break. It'll go away if I ignore it. Right? And, and you kind of realize over the years, you know, it, it, it didn't, you know, kind of go, the stress was always, the hypervigilance was always there. Um, it worked, it played to my benefit cause I got into security, got into, you know, special constable work and stuff like that. So it kind of, you know, played to my benefit there, but it, and then, but then also like, you know, my sleep was, was yeah. shit. Absolutely. You know, I maybe sleep three hours a night and that went on for four and a half years. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, that's probably one of the biggest things yeah. that you need yeah. is sleep. Oh, absolutely. But I, but I couldn't, mm-hmm. I was, my brain would just not shut off. And so what do you do? Well, I'm, at the time I'm like, well, if I'm going to be awake, I might as well work. Mm. So I just kept taking jobs, multiple jobs. I used to work with uh, what I called the Iron Man shift. So I was working two, I was working at the time, two different security jobs. I was working at the science center. I was working at the Harbor front center in Toronto. I would do an eight hour day shift at the Harbor front. No, sorry. I do an eight hour day shift at the science center. Mm. Then go down and do a 12 hour night shift at the Harbor front and then go back and do an eight hour shift at the science center. And only then would I then go home and you think, oh, you're going to sleep or like that. You know, you've just been up for 36 hours and like that. And I would go Doesn't home and I would just way. sit, I would just sit there and be like, hmm. I know I'm tired, yeah, but I, I know there's no point in sleeping because I'm going to be up in two hours. Did you turn to sleep aids or substances? <sighs> no. At, at the time I, despite me working all that, mm. I was also living in Toronto in, in Midtown, I couldn't afford substances if I wanted to. That like that. <laughs> um, and at the time I didn't realize I, you know, I, I didn't realize I could go through veterans affairs for it. And, mm. um, there was to this day and it, 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 uh, it, it still hurts to this day. Yeah. The, what not, I wouldn't say the betrayal, but when I came home, um, the reserves weren't prepared to deal with casualties from Afghanistan. Mm. It, it really is a shame because at the point where we, while we were deploying a lot of reservists were on my tour, I think, you know, my tour is almost, if, if, we were almost 50, 50 with reg force wow. in terms of the amount of people reservists that deployed and up near That's the, impressive. up near like later tours, you're getting upwards of 60% reservists were deploying on the tour. Hmm. But when we got hurt and we came home, we instantly reverted back to from, there's just three classes of reservists. There's class A, which just standard, you're going in, you sign in for your days or your weekends and you get paid for that. Class B, which is a whole other thing. You're kind of quasi full-time, quasi not. Mm. There's certain benefits depending on how long your, your contract is. It's a contract. And then class C. So you deploy, we, we deployed as a class C. You're essentially, you have all the benefits of a reg force soldier. You're full-time, um, you're, you're, for all intents and purposes, you're, you're the same as a reg force soldier. Mm. Uh, you're attached to a Rig Force battalion during that time when you're either deployed or you're doing your workup training. Um, and near the end of the tour, they offered all of us component transfers over to Rig Force because we, as far as they're concerned, we've proven ourselves. They offered it at our rank, which was almost unheard of. Um, wow. And so I got, uh, I was looking at uh, five years stint at uh, two VP in Shiloh. Really didn't want to go there, but, uh, but, it's where the next, it's where the next tour was going. Mm. This was pre-injury. I really want, my, my goal was to actually come back and at this point at the work of training, they had stood up Seesaw and I was just like, these guys are, these guys are badass. This mm. is, I really wanted to at least go try for selection for Seesaw. I was like, I'm going to come back from tour, stay fit because I'm going to be in really sure. shape and I'm going to put in my, sele- you know, maybe, maybe go to VP and then put in my selection for Seesaw. Injury changed all of that. Mm. I got injured. My CT got pulled. There's no way. I thought, and at that point, I'd, you know, so I was physically injured, so there's no way I was going to be up to try, trying out for selection. I couldn't make it through. Um, and I know at the time I wasn't thinking mentally, but ment- looking back now, mentally, there's no way I could have gone through the mental game of it or like that. So um, not a cop out, just, it just, it, it, never, what it, it is. just is what it is. It, yeah. there's the, it was the hand that life dealt me or like that. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. Anyway, as I said, so going back, I, I couldn't afford any of the substances or anything like that. Didn't realize it. And <laughs> when I got home, the, I, you know, I, I wasn't even 
When I got home, I basically got told, okay, report to the MIR at CFB Toronto mm. on Tuesday. It was like a Friday I got home. Okay. Everything's still broken. Everything's still, you know, swelled up. I was cleared to, for a flight home from the hospital in Lungstool. If I had known that the last medical care I was going to get was in Germany. Really? I would have. Stayed. Yeah. Yeah. I would have requested to stay. I would have stayed as long as I could. Hmm. I basically came home. I got landed on the, the, the tarmac in Toronto and that's where medical care stopped. He said, well, you walked in here. Okay. They're like, well, you're a class A reservist now. Class A reservist. You don't, you don't get the benefits wow. of a reg force soldier or class C. You, even though, and actually when I first got to the MIR, I, was, I, was, I got wheeled in a wheelchair mm. and they're like, I'm like, yeah, I'm here for my appointment. They're like, what appointment? They had no clue. They're like, I'm like, I'm in from Afghanistan. They're like, we don't have an injured soldier coming in from Afghanistan today. Well, I'm here. No, I'm like, well, I'm here <laughs> and right. I'm, I'm, you know, what, yeah, I'm here. Like, mm. uh, and I just got back from Afghanistan, so I don't know what to tell you. And they're like, they had to like search for the file and they're like, okay, we finally found it. Um, at this point my head's still ringing cause you know, I, I, I got, you know, I've got headaches go lower, migraines going or something like that cause of all the head injuries and the, uh, still, you know, the split skull and things like that. And, um, so anyway, the doctor comes in and he's like, oh, we looked at your file or anything like that. Uh, you know, you, we're going to probably have to transfer you to your, to your civilian doctor. Well, what civilian doctor? Anything like that. You know, like I had one, but how are they going to treat the injuries? The, the, like, you know, that. Right. I expected I might be going to, you know, I had a friend earlier in our previous tour that had been really injured in an IED strike. And, uh, when he got back, he was immediately transferred to Sunnybrook. So that's what I thought where I was going. Mm. None of that. So, and then I'm like, okay, well I document a lot of pain. You know, I got a lot of broken bones and things are, you know, still swelled up. I got a lot of cortisol going through my body like crazy or anything like that. Mm. He's like, okay, don't worry. We, you know, we'll, we'll, yeah, obviously we'll take care of that for you. They sent me to the pharmacy at, at the MIR. T3s? Oxycontin. Okay. Here, here's three bottles of Oxycontin. Take it when you feel pain. Okay. So that, I, so, okay. So I did have access to some substances sure. when I think about it or like that. Right. But probably the worst substance you could possibly totally. give. Let's just get somebody addicted. Yeah. And then to make matters even worse, this was all in one visit. To me, when I'm rolling myself back out, suddenly one of the pharmacy uh, nurses comes running up. They're like, Hey, sorry. Like, let me check what they gave you. So I, they check the, bo the bottle. They're like, yeah, this would have killed you. They gave you blood thinners by accident. Wow. First sign that everything was about to, you know, was going to go to shit for the next four years. Hmm. Wow. Uh, left my own devices after that. No, no contact with veterans affairs, no case officer assigned, nothing. Just basically get better. You have 30 days to get, actually I was told you got 30 days to get better or you're out of the army. Wow. So I showed up at my unit, you know, barely able to walk, mm -hmm. but they're like, you're back on duty. Good to go. And you're thinking, hoorah, I'm a tough guy. Here yeah, I go. I'm, I'm thinking I'm young. I can, I can, I guess this is just another thing. I'll do it or something like yeah. that. Right. Um, fast forward four years, you know, haven't slept in forever. Luckily I, I never developed a, like a really bad addiction to the oxys. Mm. I mean, I didn't like what they were doing to me. Yeah. Um, my, I decided to quit in and go just deal with the pain after I took one and my, my fiance at the time or like that, uh, she, uh, she, made, she was going to work. So she, she kissed me, you know, before she went to work, I was laying in bed, didn't have a job at the time. So I was just like, okay. Um, and what I thought was 10 minutes passed when she comes back in the room and I'm like, well, what are you, what are you doing here? Like, you know, I thought you had to go to work. She's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I thought you had to go to work. She's like, mm. babe, I've been gone. I, I went to work. She, she worked downtown mm. in Toronto. We were, we lived up at uh, like uptown. She was like, I've been gone. I've been gone for like 10 hours. Yeah. I wouldn't like that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I got to get off these things. Like, <laughs> no kidding. So, so luckily I, I, I never went down that, that, that opioid path. Thank God. Mm. But it would have been real simple to do it. I mean, yeah, they, 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 you they, up they, for gave, it. they gave it to me, Yeah, you know, right. Um, it was actually years later I was talking to, I was, at one of the, one of the, the, uh, wounded warrior events and I was talking to a general, um, which is, you know, a weird thing to say that, you know, corporal was talking to a general as we were peers, but, uh, I wasn't, you know, in the military, uh, I wasn't there as part of my military uh, rank, but, right. uh, but we were kind of shooting, you know, we were shooting it around or like that. And I actually got him to publicly admit that the army was completely unprepared for the reservists to, when to deploy 
and to be injured. They had, there was no plans. No plans at all for how to deal with reservists that had been, were injured in Afghanistan. Cause they just, it, it just had never had really occurred before. And like we, they never deployed us into a, a war zone in that type of capacity and that type of conflict. Right. Obviously we deployed into Bosnia. We'd, we'd gone to, you know, in place we'd gone, I don't, I think some of us had gone to Rwanda or something like that. Um, but it was a different combat zone. It wasn't outward, flat out combat and fighting an insurgency. Right. So, um, IEDs were, you know, mines were the main threat in a lot of Bosnia and uh, Kosovo area. We were dealing with an active IED threat that, you know, and it, so. Is this why you got involved with uh, wounded warriors? Cause you spoke at the Senate too, didn't you? I did. I testified at the Senate, uh, when I was with wounded warriors, but I, I went in, I went in as a capacity as a corporal in the army, as an injured mm. veteran, because, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. So I, yeah. really, I got a really cool story about that, uh, sure. that experience, but. Uh, how I got involved with Wounded Warriors, I, I actually knew about them for a while. I actually received one of their care packages when I was in the hospital in Germany. Um, it was a, the whole thing about Wounded Warriors was started and, uh, it was started around a soldier that, uh, a combat engineer that had been injured, uh, I forget what 06 in Afghanistan. Okay. Turns out he was my fire, uh, him and me, we had been fire team partners during boot camp and uh, soldier qualification course. So we got, we were pretty close together. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how I kind of knew about it. And then I got, I actually got into wound wounders after I got into the veterans aid space. It was actually further on down the line. Um, but, uh, no, actually how I got into the whole veterans aid space was I started off as, and it was actually my own kind of story of reclaiming my life back again, fast forward four years after my injury, no sleep, not really sure what the hell's going on with me. Um, I had kind of given up. I had pulled away from my family. Yeah. Uh, so, but for about f- almost four years, my mom didn't know if I was alive or dead. Yeah. She never, she didn't, never, she never heard from me. And, uh, at the, I, I'd gone married, gotten divorced. I'd F that relationship up mm. completely. Uh, decided to get into another relationship, which was completely destructive or like that, you know, like going down this path or like that. There's, you've heard from all the, you know, a bunch of other guys sure. I'm sure on this podcast or like, you hear from other people like, oh yeah, it was, doing really stupid stuff. Were you um, recognizing it at the time? Oh God, no, no, no. It was always someone else's, you know, it, it didn't work out because that's just the way it's supposed to go or they didn't do this or and it wasn't getting fulfilled in this way or like that. And but what had to happen for you to recognize it? I actually got extremely lucky. Um, so I went into my army unit one day and this was 2012. And went in my army unit and, uh, they, they went to me, they're like, and at this point there was maybe, there was two injured soldiers in my unit that had been injured in Afghanistan, me and a guy on 2010. Um, and they, they just, they came to me, I happened to show up mm. uh, that night and they said, Hey, you know, I think we, we, something came across our desk and uh, we think it's a good go. Now, anyone in the army will tell you when you hear a good go, you are merely suspicious of that because, uh, <laughs> it's like ice cream, you know, you know, it's like the D day and what we're doing, they're giving you ice cream. You're like, Oh, is this actually going to happen? We're, we're, we're jumping into the buzzsaw here or like that. Right. And so you're like, yeah, okay, let's, I'm willing to hear it out, but what is this good to go? I'm like thinking, I'm like, they're going to send me on, they're going to POQ. They're going to, yeah. you know, some, you know, bad drive course or some other, I'm going off to, you know, like, uh, something or like that. And they're but I'm like, okay, I'm interested. Sure. Send it my way. And, and it turned out it was the true, it was the first inaugural true Patriot love, um, March to the top. So this was true Patriot love is a, uh, non, is a charity in Toronto. And they decided they were going to do an expedition taking 12 injured soldiers, all had been, had been injured in different areas in the military, not all Afghanistan, some previous to that. Mm. Uh, and we were going to go climb a mountain in Nepal, a 22,000 foot, you know, mountain Island peak. And we were doing wow. it to raise awareness and money for injured soldiers. Had you done mountaineering before? Oh, God, no. No. That's I, an endeavor. I, I'd, I'd done some rock climbing, but like indoor rock climbing at like, you know, at some, you know, 30 so foot tall. 22,000. So if people, I'm just thinking of perspective here, Mount Baker, which is kind of the highest peak that we right. have, you can see over, that's 10, seven, I think. Yeah. So that's twice the size. That, and so 22... That, that's up there. Oh yeah. That is up yeah, there. It, it is above the clouds. What, what peak is that? Island peak. Island peak. 
So it's yeah. in it's on it's in the uh, shadow of Mount Everest. So yeah. The entire time you're climb, you're, when you actually get to the actual mountain base, you're climbing Mount Everest is right there next to you. Wow. Um, and it's about you know when you think Jesus, that's another nine thousand feet. That's right. Ten thousand feet more than what we did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we we actually our training camp was actually out here uh, in kind of not that far away from Mount Baker. Or like okay. We were, we were climbing the Columbia Ice Fields yeah, yeah, yeah. and doing a bunch of training out there. Yeah. Uh, so Great whenever training. I, yeah. Whenever I come out here, I'm always kind of like, I, I, my hotel here to now I'm here for something else. I was sleeping in my hotel. I can see the mountains and it always yeah. brings back good memories of being up there for three weeks. Just kind of training cool. rounds. But, but it was, the climb itself was amazing. I didn't, you, you don't actually realize when you think of Nepal, you think of, oh, ice climbing, you know, there's a huge amount of, you gotta, you gotta remember, you gotta get there. Yeah. First. It took, it took what, uh, 14 days just to get to the base camp. And then you're just walking mm-hmm. and it's everything from temperate forest to rainforest to rocky, you know, it. Were you set up with the Sherpas or anything? Oh yeah. Yeah. We were awesome. set up with Sherpas and it, like, it was a dream experience. We had yeah. yaks and everything, we, you know, but you're, you're, it has every train. If you went to Nepal, you could film any, any place in the world minus an urban city. You Pretty could film cool. there and you could, it could be Ireland. It could be Scotland. It could be you know, Vietnam, like it could be anywhere in the world because they have all those different environments right there with you. Wow. You're climbing, you're, you're walking across wire bridges that are 200 feet long over, you know, gorges with waterfalls or like that, that, you know. That's and, pretty cool. And you're walking paths that have been, you know, like trade routes for 2000 years. Like it's, it's, Nancy Bazaar is this amazing town built in the amphitheater of a mountain where it's literally, it's just carved out and all the town is just down this one up inside this one hill. And then they tell you, oh, Alexander the Great went through here. That's cool. You're like, Jesus, like, 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 you know, the history here. And like, just the, the, it was just amazing. So, but really it was being back in a group of soldiers and Mm. hearing some of their stories and hearing what they've kind of, some of the things they've been through. And that's when I realized, that's when it kind of clicked. I was like, I may be not okay. Mm. And it was the first time I'd cried in four years. Yeah. Finally telling them my background, my story. And unfortunately, the one downside of that is once I finally start feeling emotion again. It just opened I couldn't, the floodgates. I couldn't stop. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was, like, I, <laughs> but, but, you know, my, my girlfriend or, and I, or I started trying to start dating during this time a little bit and it was really hard to get a date. Yeah. It was really hard to keep a date after because like if, cause sometimes I would just burst, you know, just burst into tears and I'm like, I, I can't, I'm sorry. It's like, you know, trying to yeah. explain this and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, thanks. It's not sexy to <laughs> be at a restaurant and you're like just, you know, crying by your, you know, I'm like, it, it is what it is. Right. But it is what it is. And it's an absolutely normal oh, yeah. byproduct yeah. to what's going on. But I, I think. S- still didn't realize I was suffering from PTSD yet. Mm. That took another year and it was. Actually, it was after a bad drive of a Winter X with my army unit that uh, I was hanging out on just my rock. And it was just a, it, it just it, it cold. We've been freezing. Um, and it just, it was one of those weird ones where they're like, you know, take down your tent, put your tent back up, take mm. down your tent. But it was a learning yeah, experience. Yeah. <laughs> but of course they have to cram a week's worth of stuff into one day, yeah. right? So anyway. Um, anyone who says winter camping to me now, they're like, oh, let's go. I'm like, I, yeah, no, you know what? I'm good. I'll been there, okay done with that. you in the summer. How's yeah. that sound? I've been there, done that. I know how to survive in the winter. I don't need to go and mm-hmm. practice it anymore. But, uh, yeah, I was sitting on my ruck and I don't know what came over me or like that, but it just, I just broke down mm. and, uh, a sergeant came up and he's just like, you okay? And I said, no. And I think was, I was, in, I was in the throes of, d- of my divorce at that point. Mm. And it was a really tough night, uh, working a night shift or like that, uh, the previous, in the previous week. And, um, I can't remember what it was. Some, basically someone, someone posted something on my Facebook. Mm. Uh, I know I'm on a podcast right now and it's going to be on social media and stuff like that, but I got to say like, I, I'm on social media. I understand, you know, the impact it has, but mm. I don't think a lot of people understand how, what impact it can truly have. And at this point, this is early days of social, Instagram didn't exist yet. This was just Facebook. Yeah. So one of my friends decided to post a, what he thought was a supportive message on Facebook. Okay. And not thinking, not realizing that all my, you know, ex wife's friends are also on Facebook and we're all still friends. So they see this and they just start going in on me thinking that I had posted, you know, this mm. message. And one of them told me 
again through my, through a sure. message that said, you know what, it uh, just it probably would just been better if you didn't come home at all. Mm. And then it started dawning on me, and I you know I realized and I was thinking I'm like you know what yeah they're right, hundred percent right. What am I doing with my life? I'm working at you know two dead end jobs. I'm not really doing anything. I'm not successful. I've just lost you know what I thought was the love of my life. Mm-hmm. I haven't spoke to my, you know, family. I've lost all connections or like that. I don't really have any friends. I'm not making any money. <laughs> mm. Meanwhile, I'm like, I have buddies that were killed overseas that had families. They had, you know, children. They had a whole life ahead of them. They didn't get to come home. I got to come home, survive this injury, recover. And what the hell am I doing with my life? Mm. You're right. I don't deserve this. So that morning I decided I'm going to kill myself. Mm. And the only reason I'm standing here right now, sitting and talking to you and where I am is because the platform in the subway was too crowded to get to. Mm. I was, I was going to jump in front of the subway. I said, that's the, that's my, my way to go. And I just couldn't get to the platform in time in order to get in front of the subway. And then I thought even shittier about myself. Cause I'm like, I can't even kill myself. <laughs> mm. I can't even, not even successful at that. And I got really, hit a really deep low. And then I had the weekend exercise schedule and I went on it thinking, the army was the one kind of, you know, comfortable spot for me or like that. It's where I thrived or like that. And I didn't even thrive on that weekend and I just broke down. So when I came forward and I, I, I it all came out, I told the sergeant, listen, I'm, I'm going to kill myself, man. Like I'm in, I'm in a horrible spot. Mm. All, at that point within the unit, people started muckling on to me. Officers started being like, okay, well, hold on. Like there's something wrong here. We need to, this, he needs some help. Mm. So they directed me in the right direction. I did get finally in back into the MIR, which I didn't want to go. <laughs> yeah. But luckily at that point, a new doctor, a, you know, a new officer had taken over and like that. And it was a much better experience. They realized that I was suffering from something and I got some psychological care. And that's where my road to recovery started happening. The very first thing they said, and the, anybody out there right now going through this and going through, do you think you're in the worst spot of your life or anything like that? And it doesn't matter if it's caused by trauma, you're just having a shitty, shitty fucking week. Yeah. Um, the first thing is always the same thing I tell everybody is you need sleep because I guarantee your sleep, you're not sleeping. Mm-hmm. <laughs> your synapses are all screwed up, your chemicals in your brain because you're not sleeping. And, uh. Well, how do you get sleep when you're not sleeping? Well, I, 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 yeah, I was put on medication. Sure. <laughs> and I tell you, oh my God, that first, that first morning waking up, I slept 10 hours straight. Yeah. And waking up, I wouldn't say I was necessarily rested, but it was just, whoa, <laughs> night and different. day. Oh, completely. Yeah. That outlook and that perspective that you have. Yeah. People say, oh, it'll look better in the morning, right? And oftentimes yeah. it's just, you need that sleep, that regenerative, that rest process yeah. for you to have that, that different perspective. So that was the first step in the road to getting back to my recovery. Um, and starting to think straight again or something like that. After the climb, um, I did something, two, two, two page, that's how I got involved with Wounded Warriors. Somehow after the climb, they, I guess they saw something in me. Mm. I became kind of the media darling for the climb. <laughs> so True Pedro Love offered me a, uh, <laughs> looking back at it now, I'm like, I shouldn't negotiate it better, but uh, they offered me an unpaid internship to come in and work as a marketing intern. And that's when I got my very first taste of kind of doing stuff for veterans, mm. seeing that there was a group out there, non-government agency, trying to uh, help out vets. And I, it was cool. I got handed a project working with Degree, the deodorant company. Yeah. And, and, tu- and Tough Mudder. Cool. So I put together a team of wounded vets that was going to run Tough Mudder. But we did like, you know. We're in cross prom- Yeah. Cross promotion was Degree. Yeah. And, that's where the very first degree do more commercial came from or like that mm. from Canada. Uh, you can find on YouTube. We did I remember that commercials one. for them. Um, which I thought was kind of cool. And that was my first kind of experience project managing that. Yeah. And, uh, but then my, my time came up at TPL. They decided we're not going to offer you a full-time position. It was, you, you were, you were great for us, but it, you know, we're going in a different direction. Okay. No, no hard feelings or anything like that. Sure. Um, Oh, well, a little bit hard feelings to be honest with you. Cause I was like, yeah, come on. Like, uh, like right. I, I'm a perfect for this next role, but, but then they kind of direct me to some other charities and that's when kind of wounded warriors started getting involved and they're like, we, we, you know, we've seen you, we've seen you at a couple, at your, a couple of your talks you've done or anything like that. We like what you have to say. We like your message. 
And they brought me in initially as a volunteer coordinator for Ontario. And that kind of blossomed into, well, you know, we need a new financial director. Would you be interested? At the time I was working at a bank. So they're like, man, he must know finances. That's right. I was a mortgage analyst. I don't know how I even got that, to be honest with you. TD hired me. Um, well, no, that's not true. I, 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 at this point, I had enough experience in working with different the charities that I learned that, you know, a lot of guys don't think as an infantry you have any skills to bring any job. You actually have a huge amount of transferable skills. Mm. You just got to learn how to sell them. Mm. So I remember I was actually, I remember I was at the interview for TD Bank and I'm in a room, you know, waiting and there's all these people with master's degrees in finance and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, I got to call a certificate in, you know, firefighting. <laughs> yeah. But I show up Whew. every day. I'm on time. That's true. I, but I present well. I, so they said, name us a time. And I'm like, oh, the interview's going okay. But I'm like, yeah, I don't really, I'm not really sure they're, they're, they're buying it. But I was always told, okay, you got to do something to set yourself apart. You got to do something to set yourself apart. How do you sell your skills? And then you went, and then I got the, name us a time that you exemplified customer service under stress. <laughs> and I'm like. <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. Let me tell you this time I was in, you know, the, the, I was in the Argandab going through a village and then I'm like, they're like, what, the what and where? <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm in Afghanistan and we're clearing a village and I come into, the, I come onto this. Now we didn't have a platoon with us. I literally had me and six guys and we're clearing a village. This was completely. Okay, but it's what you had on hand or like that. So we're clearing this pocket of these, uh, like, you know, gray pots and stuff like that. And I enter into a gray pot uh, to clear it. And I get an AK-47, I came with an AK-47 in my face. Hmm. Okay, well, he's got the drop on me. If he wants to shoot, but is he Taliban? Is he just a civilian? Like, everyone has a gun over there or like that. Hmm. I had all within my ROEs to shoot him. Sure. And instead I held my hand out, managed to get him to put down his gun and me, you know, and sit there and just kind of talk and calm him down. And then, so I could go about my way. Mm. So next thing you know, you know, he's, he's no longer my enemy. He's now my, he's now at least a non-combatant. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to shoot a kid. I didn't have to kill anybody. I sold NATO. <laughs> yeah. Tell me a more a better customer service <laughs> under stress. <laughs> Beat that everyone else. Come right? on. I'm not and they and they hired me based on that interview. Mm, that's awesome. And I went and went in as a mid level manager, what not my manager, but a mid level position or like that mm -hmm. uh, within the, the bank. So anyway, Winter Wars was like, he knows finances. Let's bring him over as a fundraising director. Like this offered me this role. And I was working with Winter Wars for a couple of years in that in that role. At this point, though, I was starting to feel that I went to all these different dinners, all these different events, and while I felt we were helping vets, it started feeling that my story was least was no longer becoming my story, mm. the one I've just told you, like that. It was yes. now becoming the narrative of a charity. Yeah, and I started feeling that I wasn't really. I need to reclaim my 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 tale because it's mine. It's no one else's. Yeah. And, uh, that's weirdly enough. And again, just the way fate works, I guess, or like that. Uh, I got involved with Stoker Canada, but in not, but in the, in the sense that they wanted to get involved in helping vets. So they were my client for a while. Really? Yeah. They, they were my client. Uh, I went and did a couple of trade shows with them. Yeah. Uh, but as the wounded warrior, like director and like that. So I would do some cross promotions with them and they'd be able to push wounded warriors and get people to sign up and donate and stuff like that. And then I'd be there answering questions of the charity, but that I was also really into firearms. I, I had my pal. I like, you know, so I saw this, I'm like, this is a great opportunity to, and I, I was talking with a bunch of the sales reps and stuff like that. And then when they would go off for lunch into trade shows, I was the only one left sometimes in the booth. Then I'd be like, guys would come up and I'd start sure. regurgitating what I heard about the guns and learning about them. Yeah. Anyway, the GM at the time saw that I was selling the guns. And I'm like, he's like, you're selling guns better than you're selling your charity. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know. I'm passionate about this right <coughs> now. <coughs> sorry. Sorry. Uh, you know, direct, the director of the charity. Mm -hmm. uh, I apologize in advance, but, uh. But yeah, I just, it, I, you know, I just realized this is kind of a cool company. Never thought a million years anything would come of it. Just, it was a fun partner to work with. Um, 
And then unfortunately, my predecessor at the at the Stoger uh, fell ill. Mm. He was a yeah, he can tell his own story. Like sure. that, uh, I'm, I'm not here to tell his, but he, he fell ill and it was deemed that he, he had, he could no longer work. Mm. So I got called into Stoger, the Stoger can office. I'm thinking, okay, they're either going to, they're, they're either going to cut me a check or they want to talk about, you know, if there's something we can do to help out their, their manager. So I'm sitting there with, uh, I'm with Spiros, who's the, uh, yep. now the, the GM of, uh, Norman Pre- Precision USA, but he was our GM at the time. And, uh, we're just kind of talking and we're kind of like, and I'm starting to see that like the conversation's kind of going towards, well, do you know anybody that would be good for this role? They need to be this, 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 this. And I'm like, that's all me. Mm. So I call them out. I said, I'm just, I'm like, are you offering me a job? <laughs> He's like, do you want a job? I'm like, hell yeah. Awesome. And I'm like, if, if you offer to me right now, I will go back to my charity and I will quit today. <laughs> mm-hmm. Not that I. I didn't want to still work with veterans, but it just, I, I need, a change needed to happen there. Something had to change, yes. He couldn't offer me a job right then and there, but he basically said, if the job, if you want the job, the job is yours. So a couple of weeks passed and we finally got the job off. I wasn't going to do anything until I got a job offer and signed the contract. Um, but that was all done. I handed my resignation in to, to Wounded Warriors and I, I've been with Stoger for eight years, you know, almost eight years now doing what I'm currently doing, which is uh, military law enforcement, basically uh, sales manager. Yep. So working with doing all the government contracting, working with the D and D to get them their new weapon systems, um, equipment, working with all law enforcement agencies in Canada, uh, helping out individual officers as well. Yeah. You know, for, even though it's not necessarily, you know, military product, but if they need any of their hunting needs and stuff, we do that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, it's customer service. Yeah. That's what it is. And, you know, and for, you know, getting that contacts there, but, uh, it's just, you know, it, and then in the last couple of years, in a lot, well, in the last year, I've kind of really been thinking of getting back into the, in some capacity, veterans helping out vets, whether it's telling my story in some capacity, a podcast or something like that. I'm not sure I'm ready to start my own podcast yet, but in some regards of saying, you know, there is light out there. Mm. Afghanistan's over, but there, I'm sure the guy's still suffering from it. But now we got a whole other group of people now deploying over to other areas, maybe not combat zones, but training accidents occur. Finding ways to systemize the message and let people know, be able to communicate what you know in a way that other people will hear yeah. at the widest possible scale. Yeah. And I think that's something to sit down think about and what, what makes the most sense for you. But I mean, even just talking on this podcast, you bring up a bunch of points of similarities People will have similarities. They might have different backgrounds, different life experiences, different tolerances, different, mm-hmm. oh, and, yeah. and yeah. different ways of yeah. interpreting things. You and I could be in the exact same situation, but just because of those differences, it affects us in completely different ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Having these conversations, uh, normalizes it. I think that's a, probably the biggest, most important part and something I really appreciate about you is being able to have that conversation without it being you, right? Yeah. I, I am yeah. not my PTSD. I am not my, it's, I'm, I'm not the, the cut I got on my arm before that's healed up, right? Yeah. It sucked at the time, but it's healed and yeah. now, now we're on there. And I think that's, uh, I, I'm from my perspective, probably a massive value that you could provide to everyone else. I, I, I'm hoping so. Um, you know, it, it's. <sighs> It sucks to say that I've lost almost as many friends overseas as I have that lost the battle at home. Mm. Um, you know, we, we, yeah, guys died over, you know, on tour or sure. like that. But I've been to enough ram ceremonies in my time that I never want to have to go to another one again. But I've done them since we've come home. And that's the number that absolutely kills me with like that is that, and I was almost one of them myself. Well, I wanted um, to, to talk about that because it's an interesting thing. And you said the Facebook post, would it be better if he just didn't come back or it would be better if he just didn't come back? And you said, yeah, they're right. Yeah. I should kill myself. And I think the disconnect that's very difficult for a lot of people to see when they lack the sleep, when they're lacking the direction, when they're lacking, maybe their substances, maybe they're not eating right, when they're not exercising right, all, all of these different things that come into it is that logically maybe they were right. 
maybe there was a part of you that shouldn't be coming back. Yeah. You need to change. And it doesn't have to be a physical death. It can be a spiritual death or a, sure, yeah, right. Yeah, There's yeah. a part of you that that's not right. That needs to change and it can die as you don't run away, but you run towards something more desirable. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's the hard part that a lot of people, uh, perhaps get stuck up on when they're lacking all that sleep and not thinking right. It's like, okay, logically, yeah, there's something that's not right. Okay. It needs to stop. How do I stop it? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it, and I'm especially after everything we've gone through, like just as a, not just the military, but everyone, everyone has gone through over the last three years or whatever, however long it's been, I think there's a little more understanding of, you know, what mental health not is, but maybe what m more, what mental health is not. Mm. Right. Um, everyone's stressed. I, 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 I've talked to a couple of groups since the pandemic and I'm just like, the I, 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 about three or four times a year, I, le I guess lecture at Centennial College in Toronto okay. to the, of all people, to the RMT students. Okay. Um, to explain them what, what, you know, sometimes what mental, what military combat trauma can do, not to a, just a military member, but similar experiences amongst first responders, police, sure. firefighters. These are some of your, your clients you're going to get. And how typically, uh, a registered massage therapist, that's going to be, you're going to be the first gateway to their therapy. Mm -hmm. They won't go see a therapist because I'm not weak. I'm not going to go talk to someone. Right. They won't go, you know anyone else to a doctor, but I'll go for a massage. Sure. Because that's, that's, there's nothing weird about that or like that, right? A young, attractive girl, right? You know, like, like, right. like, like, of course, why not? What are you going to do that? You're going to be the very first point of contact and the body holds trauma. That's a good point. The very first time I went for a massage, I, again, it, I, 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 I teared up because they, once they started working on my hip. So t t I've heard this time yeah. again, the body yeah. holds trauma. What, what does that mean? How does that happen? I, you know, I can't even explain how it happens exactly. I'm not, I, I don't have enough medical knowledge sure. to explain it. What I can say is that literally in so, something within your muscles or anything like that, mm. it holds almost memories of that trauma that occurred in that incident or anything like that. Sometimes when you, like, I know when I wake up on a cold morning, mm. every injury I've had to my, you know, all 15 years of infantry to my right. experience with my knees, my, you know, hamstring tears I've had, stuff like yeah. that. Oh, I feel every single one of those. Yeah. It's different type of trauma, but yeah. it's still there. That's the easiest. But think about that is you've suffered a major physical injury. You've recovered, but there's mental impact, the things that have happened there. Your brain is no different from your heart or any other muscle with it. It's still sending out, you know, it's chemicals all working together. and all working together. And that somehow cast, you know, where you had that trauma, it stays there or like that. And sometimes when you go for a massage and I'm saying this to anyone that's going through this or like that, the very first time you go, don't be surprised if you have an, a real emotional reaction <laughs> mm. because it's, and I tell that to the RMT students as well, is don't be surprised if they have an emotional reaction to you, you know, touching That's them and doing your point. work. Um, because it, it very likely will happen. Mm -hmm. Also, I was always tell them, build your, you know, build your, your inner circle of trusted, you know, uh, medical professionals with you, psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, because you being their first point of contact, they, they trust you, mm -hmm. especially if they come to you for a long time, they trust you. Now, I also tell RMT students, a military or first responder is probably going to be your best client you've ever had because they're going to come to you for life if they trust you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're like, yeah, I'm going to go to them or mm -hmm. like that. Um, so you got a lifelong client there. That's good for you. That's good for your business. But, uh, but you only can treat so much or like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to take on that, that trauma either or like that. But, uh. -huh. uh so build that client, build up that professional network because there might be a time when you say, Hey, like, you know, I, I might know someone you want to talk to. And normalizing the, yeah. and yeah. having the right words to express it makes it a lot easier. Absolutely. Right. If someone had told me, you know, I, the very first therapy I ever had in that four year stint when, vet, when the army wasn't looking after me was the only therapy I had was RMT. Mm. Cause I had a friend that was an RMT, uh, that owned an RMT clinic and she was willing to treat me for free. Perfect. That was it. You're not always going to get that. I got the lucky enough that I, that, sure. that I had that or like that. But so it, it's building up that support base or like that, um, building up both for the, the 
practitioner, but also for, nor I just said normalizing it for the actual soldier themselves. No more asking for the for their first responder. No more asking for the everyday person because everyone's going through stress. Sure. And I said when I talked to RMT students since the pandemic, I'm just like, okay, who's stressed out here? No one puts up their hand. I'm like, okay. BS guys, come on. <laughs> we just went through a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. The whole world shut down. Yeah. Everyone here should have their hands up that you guys are stressed out. If anyone who's not, I seriously want to know one, your trick and two, you're a psychopath, dude. Like <laughs> <laughs> you don't feel things. Yeah. So, but I tell them it's nothing wrong with that. You've just joined the rest of our community mm. of stressed out PTSD stricken first responders and soldiers. We've been dealing with this for 10, 15 years. <laughs> so there's, right? uh, like, I think DSM four, uh, says, uh, PTSD needs a life threatening trigger to be, yeah. I think yep. DSM five says there's CPTSD or complex PSD, uh, PTSD. I, did they remove that life threatening thing? I, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I yeah, I mean, there, there's, uh, I mean, mine was definitely there sure. was, I, my, there was definitely was a life threatening element to mine. Uh, sure. I, 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 my heart did stop on the helicopter ride back to calf from mm -hmm. the injury incident or like that. I had to be, I had to be brought, brought back and stuff like that. Again, no memory of it, but being in a coma for three weeks, you have a life threatening injury like that. You, mm -hmm. your brain's basically telling your organs to shut down. <laughs> I think, I think a lot of people, but I, there was a chocolate bar guy. Did we talk about today? Uh, you know what? No, but the, on the other podcast you did or like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's right. Nathan and I talked about the chocolate bar guy, the guy who goes into, for people who haven't listened to that one, um, ordinary individual, this guy's not a soldier. He's not a first responder, goes into his corner store, buys a chocolate bar, uh, starts eating it, gets halfway through and it's full of maggots and he goes back. Guy's like, oh, I'll give you another bar, give you a refund, whatever it is. Day's over. I mean. All right. So he ate some maggots, right? Yeah, That's yeah. most people would look at it like that. But then he stops, he thinks everyone's laughing at him. He thinks everyone's going to be talking about yeah, the yeah. maggot eater. Doesn't want to go to his, I guess he was involved with the church. Doesn't want to go to the church group because he figures or starts avoiding things. He right. starts having reoccurring thoughts. He starts, and all of these typical PTSD type, uh, symptoms from eating a chocolate bar with maggots yeah. in it. So yeah. when you're talking about everyone's stressed, everyone's got something. I think that there is a uh, value to people understanding that whether or not they meet a clinical definition or not in yeah. some yeah. book that a, that a guy made, if they're seeing these sort of things that they're going through, there is a path forward that they yeah. can take that others have taken that's proven successful. And, and I think you raise an excellent point there. And I think one of the things that needs to be said, and I mean, <laughs> you, ask any any, especially but infantry guys, ask any veteran out there like that. There is no community that is harder on ourselves than our community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you were going to find, and it happened to me where I, I came forward with my injury, even years after I came forward with my injury, with my, my, you know, problems and stuff like that, where I was told, you know, what's wrong with you? Just suck it up. What, 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 right. is, your, what is your problem or anything like right. that? Really like. So-and-so's got it worse. Yeah. So I've done. Yeah. You know, like, oh, well, and, and there's, we're always comparing tours. Yep. Like, oh, well, you went to a, I, I remember I spoke at a, uh, at a, uh, charitable bike, uh, bike, like motor, like motorcycle rally or anything like that. And all these were, it was a, one of the veterans motorcycle groups. And I didn't know too much about them, but I was like, yeah, they asked me to come out and talk to them. I'm like, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you before you kick off your ride. And. I was told, tell your story. Okay. So I told my story. Mm. That's when I just told you. It was about Afghanistan. Mm. And later I got a seething, angry email from the organizer, from the, the, of the president of the riding company saying, you didn't once talk about Bosnia. All these guys that served in Bosnia and Kosovo and Rwanda. Sure. I'm like, okay. Was I supposed to? But absolutely. <laughs> Why did you not talk about that? I wasn't there. Right. <laughs> Be hard for you to I, talk about. I it. was in grade school when you guys That's deployed right. there. Like uh, I was still, you know, I was eight years old when you deployed into, you know, Bosnia or Rwanda. Yeah. My war was Afghanistan. Mm. Well, that wasn't a real war. Uh, okay. Here we go. <laughs> so this whole thing starts to, yeah. we are horrible to ourselves, to each yeah. other like that. And that leads, I think, to the same thing this guy with the chocolate. You start getting feelings of, well, I don't have it that bad. Right. People are going to laugh at me if I come forward. And I'm really worried about this next generation of soldiers deploying because they're deploying to places like Latvia, Jordan, 
Poland, UK, to mm -hmm. train the Ukrainians and for and to do Operation Impact to yeah. mop up operations in Iraq. Who knows where, if we're going to be involved in the Middle East in some regard with what's going on there. Africa, probably yeah. the, if we have any troops left, and I think we have some troops in Africa, but especially in like the Western African regions, that's the closest thing you have to putting troops in an area where there's open conflict where Canadians could actually get shot at. Mm. So now you have all these Afghan vets and ones that are still left over, but the ones that are now gone out that are, are we going to treat the, the, the guys that are deploying to Latvia as somehow their tour was less than ours mm. because we got shot at and they're just training the Ukrainians that are going to go off to war. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's on, it's an unfair comparison. Sure. If, if a soldier gets, it'll hurt, happen. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. I know, I know, I know it will, but a soldier gets hurt in training. Why isn't any different from the fact that I got hurt on a combat patrol in Afghanistan and I wasn't injured due to combat action. I don't have a sacrifice medal because I don't qualify for it. Mm. That hurt, that, that bugged me for a long time. Sure. I could see that. Right. Not that I wanted an extra piece of bling on my chest. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> sure. But you know, that's not, we, 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 we measure ourselves with the amount of medals you got or things like that. It's not a fair comparison. Mm. Uh, but it's the fact that, you know, you, you have guys now deploying in non-combat roles, but they do a very, very serious, important job. They're away from home for months on end. They've left their families. Training incidents, training accidents are just as deadly as combat related incidents or things like that. And I don't, you know, I really hope that any of these guys could come back where if they were involved in a serious training accident where they got hurt, it doesn't diminish at all what they're going through, either physically or mentally. Mm -hmm. The fact, and I've heard it from other, even today, I've heard it from people when I said, well, I got hurt in Afghanistan. My story was being told to a group of vets and they got hurt in a training accident in Canada. And mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, but like my injury is not as, it's not as, it's not as severe as yours. Why? Well, because it didn't occur on tour. Mm. What, what does that matter? It doesn't. Dude, you lost a leg. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm still intact. Or like, you know, like, like you've had, you actually have severe, you have more severe injuries than I do, but it doesn't matter what, what in, you know, like the fact of the matter is, is that you were injured in your line of service. Same thing as a cop, you know, you were injured. I talked to tons of cops who are like, yeah, but you were injured in Afghanistan, man. That's like serious stuff. Dude, you got shot <laughs> by, by some gangbanger <laughs> <laughs> or you got the crap beat out of you by a bunch of, you know, drug, yeah. you know, like drug guys or anything like that. Right. But when you were, you know, had to go in alone or like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it really, why are we comparing this? Trauma is trauma. <laughs> I, you, and you I think that's a massive point. Right. That like people should be, I've got a couple of, and I'm going to just ADHD diverge sure. here just a little bit. Uh, a couple of questions about things we talked about earlier, which is, um, uh, your job. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, supplying arms and equipment to military, different armies, but you were saying it's kind of like a brotherhood working with the competitors right. as well out there. Yeah. I, I guess I should probably talk about job here since that's what I'm really here to, that's what <laughs> I'm being brought here to do. Uh, believe it or not, I do work for Breda, uh, yeah. despite everything I've said. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, uh, just like the army is in Canada is fairly small, yeah. the defense industry is even smaller. Yeah. There's only, you know, a couple, you know, there's only so many players in the, in the, in the game or like that. Uh, we're one of them. And, uh, so, you know, the Canadian army only puts out so many, uh, tenders a year, mm -hmm. you know, for, especially, particularly for firearms, you know, it's a, it's a hard, you know, it's not always, everyone's competing for the same thing or like that. Uh, you know, couple, last year, back in 2020, we won the sniper rifle contract or like that. And it was a big win for us. It was great. Totally. But we were competing against, you know, three other bidders or like that. And we had a bit, we had outbid them. A lot of people think that that would may lead to an environment of extreme competitiveness and well, like, I don't like that guy or like animosity that, right? and animosity and just don't talk to him or anything like that. And, but it, it, it is, as I said, as you said, it really kind of is a bit of a brotherhood in its own right. Um, I'm going to, uh, later, well, actually, we have, so we have a range day tomorrow, yep. uh, at, B, at the range Langley, uh, here in BC. It's one of our, it's our first ever BDT range day we're running. Yeah. Uh, so I got Got to promote that. Yeah. Uh, all military law enforcement are allowed to come out. It's a free event. But, what's uh, it going to look like? We're going to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're really happy the range Langley came out and supported us on that. Yeah. I, I, I should plug this after. It's like that. But get back to them. 
the point. But uh, but then there's OPEX West, Operator mm-hmm. Expo West happening in Burnaby. And my fellow, you know, competitors are going to be there. Yeah. We're all promoting, you know, our, our goods. We're all competing for the exact same, you know, maybe five tenders that are out there, something like that. Mm. And uh, we also are all probably going to meet up after the show and go out for beers. Amazing. Like, you know, I... We, we actually let each other know when tenders come out. Awesome. Like, I don't have to notify. That's kind of unheard of. That's unheard of yeah. in, in other industries. Like I, it, I, even, especially also if like it's happened where I'm like, I don't have necessarily a product that I think can compete on this tender, but I know someone that will, mm-hmm. I will send them that tender. Even though technically I could be like, well, I, I send that to you. So you owe me a finder's fee or like that, or I'll, I'll find, or I could find a product that would a bid. It's. Yeah. I'd rather send them off to somebody else. I, that's good business in my opinion. I've yeah. never been a fan of the, the finder's fee, the referral fee, the, cause you're always going to question the, um, the motivation behind it afterwards. Yeah. And I truly believe, you know, people say, you know, business isn't personal. I disagree. I think business is based on personal relationships, which require trust, which are built over time and yeah. all business is personal. Yeah. You make pragmatic decisions within that. But you got to yeah. respect the personal. Well, and, and what you said there, business, you know, isn't personal. Business is extremely personal for me. Right. I was an operator. Mm. I was a door kicker. I was the guy, I'm, I was the guy that was, that we're trying to get these, this equipment too. And I've told, you know, all my clients that if you pick, you know, if you put out a tender or you're, you're looking, you're interested in a product, if you pick my product, great. It's great for my bottom line. Sure. <laughs> we, you know, it keeps the lights on our shop. It keeps me employed. Mm. That's important to me. Um, uh, you know, life's not cheap right now or like that, nope. and, you know, uh, but, uh, and neither is, oh, neither is daycare or like, or like, oh, God, <laughs> it's like another mortgage payment in itself. Totally. But, uh, but the, at the end of the day, my ultimate goal is to make sure you have the best product for your job. If that's not my product and one of my competitors, I'm ha- I'm fine with that. I would rather you have the best gear and the best equipment you, you could possibly have. Um. And I really, really, you know, so I really hope it's mine. Mm-hmm. We'll try to make that work or like that. But if I really, truly feel that it's not, or it's just not going to work, or it just ends up not working out, mm. but you feel you got the best, you know, equipment possible. Yeah. Last thing I want is an operator fielding a piece of equipment that ends up failing and, you know, puts them in jeopardy or like that. And I think we all, well, that's all some... within the industry, we feel the same way or like that more or less. We, we want. It's a group of people who are playing the long game. Yeah. The short game is how do I make my buck? How do I make it now? And then I'm gone. Yeah. The long game is based on that level of integrity and those yeah. relationships. Well, and, and anyone who can tell you that's in government procurement, it's, it's a long game, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yes. It, it took 40 years for them to design, to get a new pistol right? yeah, like yeah. that to replace the Brownings. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, you're in this for the long haul. <laughs> <laughs> we've had an exceptionally busy time. Uh, and we've been luckily very successful over the last couple of years in tenders, but uh, it's not uncommon that you, you could have, you could go your entire 30 year career and only really have maybe three or four programs at the federal level come out. If somebody wanted to get into this line of work, is that a, uh, a difficult thing for them? Um, cause there's not too many openings I would think. There's not, no. Um, I think unfortunately there, there, you know, there's, there's not that many openings out there. There's, you know, there is opportunities that mm-hmm. always arise, but generally, yeah, when you when you get into the, you know, if I've been lucky enough the way I did get into it or something like that and the way, and, and get, you know, be involved in this trade, mm. you don't typically leave it unless you really want to, <laughs> unless you just can't, you know, you are, it's a, it's a good position to be in or something like that. Sure. Um, but you know, there's always, to anyone, to, you know, ex-military or uh, currently serving military that's thinking of getting out there and like that, uh, police and stuff like that. The, I don't know why you would leave your police job, to be honest with you, because it's a pretty sweet job, but it, you know, but. Maybe, maybe they want to do fire Maybe instead. they want to do something. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I will admit, and you know, like you know, adversary thing, I, I was trained as a firefighter and a mm. fire protection engineer. So, you know, I tell that to some of my cop, cl- my police clients and they're like, uh, yeah, I don't think you can, uh, you can get it. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, it's not, I'm not working on it now. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, they, anyone is. Uh, you know, I, I get all asked all the time by, you know, by a lot of military guys. Oh, well, are you, are you hiring? Uh, no, we're not. Mm. Doesn't mean we're never, go- not never gonna, but you need a particular set of skills. You need to be able to, you know, have, 
just be, having just been a door kicker or just being an infantry or just being worn uniform, unfortunately, isn't enough. Sure. You also have to have some sort of skills in sales. Yeah. You have to have a personality. Yeah. Um, you have to have the ability to actually sell yourself or anything like that. You can, if you can sell yourself, you can sell anything else. Mm. And that's what most sales people right? are. Their you, first and foremost yeah. job is to sell themselves. I'm selling myself to these agencies. I might right. ask, I want them to come back to me and talk to me. Mm-hmm. But it's not, you know, the product is a, an afterthought or something like that. I want mm. them to know that I'm there to help them out. That if they call me up at, you know. That they can trust you. Yeah. If they call me up at three o'clock in the morning and say, hey, this, you know, we need something right now with like that. Can you help us out? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to suck, but I, I will do, I will do it for you or something like that. Because right. that's what, you know, uh, I would expect that myself or something like that. Yeah. Because I've been on the, I've been on the front line. I've been on, I've been in the field where gear fails. Gear will fail no matter how good it is. Yep. And you want to have a solution right then and there. You can't afford to not, right? So, uh, but yeah, so the whole industry is a bit of a brotherhood or like that. We all kind of, you know, we, we, we're all in competition with each other, as I said. Mm. We all do get along. And uh, it, that relationship amongst that is just, it, it's just as important to me as is building relations with governments, with agencies, with uh, anything along those lines. Because... Without that, you know, sometimes you got to work together on a contract. Mm -hmm. You don't have a choice in the matter. When we did the C-19 Ranger Rifle Program, Tika, we were, I, I mean, it's an interesting project manager position for me. It was when the, when I first got into Stoger, that was, I was handed that project. Like, okay. This is yours to manage now. So I'm managing it between the government of Canada, ourselves, our manufacturer, Tika, and Cold Canada. Because Cold Canada, the contract's with Canada, but it has to go through the MSP partner, Cold Canada. Mm. So we're supplying them all the parts. They're assembling it. They're putting the rifle together. We're, then we're getting the D and I'm managing all the different things together and making sure everyone plays nice yep. in the sandbox. <laughs> and it, it's diff, it not, doesn't always work out well. Just sure. like you know, just like you know, brothers are gonna are gonna fight or something, sure. like that, right? But uh, you kind of gotta. That's what you gotta do. And the unique position of being bre of working with bread is that we are uh, still family owned. We that's have been right. for 15 generations. So it's still a brother brother that's running the company. That's crazy. That's uh, nuts. But, uh, and they buy, the, the, they buy companies to bring them into the fold. Mm. So like Tika Sacco, you know, Steiner, so, like they, they buy them outright. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're working under a contract where it could, the contract could end up, you know, expiring. Mm hmm so we can offer that kind of, you know, experience within the, uh, the fantasy industries that, you know, and it came up with the sniper rifles that, you know, we offer the, we won the contract for the rifle. Then we won the contract for the scope because it's all within the same company. Right. Then we won the contract for the ammo. Right. Because <laughs> we have an ammo manufacturer as well. So we can provide that full package, different three tenders and we all, sure. you know, uh, had to bid on separately, but. It def definitely gives a leg up though. It gives us, I'd say there's definitely an advantage there. Sure. And it's nice the fact we, we don't have shareholders we have to answer to. We're answering to one guy. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, it's a unique, I think, in this world to have that yeah. type of thing happen. Um, and we, we can't just be like, you know, the shareholders will be like, we don't want to get in the, we want, we don't want to be in the firearms business anymore. Mm -hmm. We're getting out. This is what. And next thing you know, your company's, you know, done. Yeah. It's been sucked out of, you know, of all the assets you had. I don't think Brett is getting out of the firearms industry in a time soon. They've been in it for 500 years. <laughs> yeah. I don't see it either. Yeah. So, uh, um, and there's a lot of investment there in that regard. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, we're, we're, we're going to go, we're, we're still going strong in it. And, uh, as I said, uh, it, it's, it really was a unique experience for me to come in at the level I did into this industry. I had, you know, some work before as range safety officers and stuff like that at certain indoor ranges, but then to jump right into the role I had because of the skill sets I had was something Everything really happens yeah. for a reason. I truly believe that. Yeah. And it, it really worked out well. Um, I just happened to also live in the exact same town that the office is in. So that worked out well as local. Yep. And, uh, you know, and it, it, I would, you know, it, I wouldn't change anything for it. I, I think I, I. It's really interesting having been an operator, been, you know, an infantier. Um, when I say operator, I want to make it clear. I was never special forces. I just mm -hmm. say operator because it's the, I guess the funky term now or something like that. Sure. I was, I was so, an inf inf cool. infantry soldier. Oh, operator. Uh, yeah. I'm not trying to sound cooler than, you know, it is or anything like that. I'm not trying to, you know, mm -hmm. I, there's people out there going to fat check it. Oh, he was never a seesaw or a yeah, you, yeah, yeah. yeah, I never was. I'm not trying to say that I was, um, 
But what's cool is I get to work with them. Yeah. So something I could never do within the army. Yeah. You're still able to. Now I get to work with them and train with them and equip them and, but also be able to equip, you know, regular soldiers, regular, you know, army guys. See the, see that uh, it's been a huge pride to me, uh, that I was involved in that sniper C21, uh, program mm -hmm. that I don't know if I had a lasting effect when I was in uniform on anybody other than some soldiers I trained and maybe on my, on you, my unit itself. Mm -hmm. I am in my unit's history books. And I carried, I carried my Royal, you know, my, my Royal Regiment of Canada. I carried their flag up into the Nepal. It's been up above the clouds, 22,000 feet. That's cool. I'm in their history book. But other than that, it was, you know, I'm not sure what impact I had within the army. Sure. But I know now that I'm no longer in the uniform but I'm doing what I'm doing now that I had an impact in the army. Hell yeah. They got a new sniper rifle because of the work we did and what I did. And that, uh, you know, whether they have it for five years, 10 years, 30 years, the fact is they got a new weapon platform and mm -hmm. it, it's, my name is on it. And that's no simple feat. Like you mentioned with the, uh, Browning high power. Oh, God, it's no, no simple feat. No. It, that program started long before I was in the company. Yeah. Um. But you got your fingerprints on it. Yeah. And we, I was the one that put the bid in yeah. that, that took it from, you know, Amazing. RFI to RFP. It, you know, I was involved with it for four years until we finally delivered the very first rifle to Canada. Like that. And uh, there's something I can always, uh, no matter what I do in my life, there's something I can say is I did something greater than, you know, the, the small pieces I did in the army or anything like that. And not diminishing, not diminishing my service, but it just. Well, you're doing something right now as well. And whether you see it or not, and I'm pretty sure you see it, you're doing something right now and just what you're sharing by sharing your story in the path that you're taking with your physical and mental health that other yeah. people will look at and it'll make an impact. I'm always surprised at people who come up to me and say, thank you so much. Just the other day I was at uh, Remembrance Day ceremony and one guy looks over and sees my hat I'm wearing and he's like, well, I've, I've done level one, level two courses with you guys before. Oh, that's, thank you. That's cool. Another guy yeah. comes up as I'm, I'm leaving and says, you don't know me. This is my name. I really want to thank you so much for the guests that you had on. It really made a, a big difference to me. Yeah. And, um, I know for a fact that the story that you've shared is going to have the same, whether we oh, hear back on well, it or I, not, I, it's I, gonna... I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I, I also, you know, want to make it. Just going back to the, the mental health side of it, mm -hmm. like that, I want to make it clear that like I'm doing much better than I did back in 2012, 20, 2000, you know, yeah. from the injury now, it, it, it's not, it never goes away though. No, it's, it's, it. it's, it's weird. It's ugly head. Sure. You manage it. Yeah. You manage it. I'm, I was told for a while there, I was like, oh, like it's almost like a cancer treatment. You're, you're in remission right now. You're doing good. You're, I was able to go in a public to the mall. I wasn't having the triggers I was having. Um. Last, you know, little while or like that, to kind of, you know, in the last year since my son turned one and he's about to turn yeah. two now or something like that, life changes or anything like that. There's stresses now or like that, that, that weren't there. And something was kind of triggering a little bit of it. And I, I found myself getting, going, going, going bound the path again of mental, like I'm not yeah. doing so good or anything like that. Right. And so it, it's a constant management of it. It's going to be a balance. And that's it, it, it's a constant fight. Yeah. And so, but I had the tools now to recognize What's going on? I'm like, I'm not doing well. I know now I have a partner in life that I can talk to uh, mm. about it. She, you know, she's, she's awesome. She's with me. She's been with me through a lot of the recovery process and all like that. So I'm, I now know that be like, Hey, I'm not doing so good. And mm -hmm. I need to tell you to talk about it or I need to be left alone for a little while. Well, being able to recognize yeah. that is massive and knowing that, okay, I've come this far. I recognize that it's never too late to stop regroup. Yeah. And pick a new direction. That's right. Cause so many people, well, in for a penny and for a pound, I'm already going down this I'm, road. I'm, I'm here. Gonna, I'm going to hammer on through, you right. know, like push through the objective or anything yeah. like that. And sometimes you got to be like, well, well, hold on. You're, you can't always do that across the board. And if you do, the consequences of doing that may be more than your, than your, than it's worth or like that. Right. Um, and I've seen it, you know, why do you think divorce rates are so high? Sure. Amongst, uh, service members. Or like sure. that. Why do you think suicide rates are so high amongst men? Yeah. Is that you can't, it, it, sometimes pushing through the objective is maybe just not the, maybe the best decision for you. Taking yeah. the second to be like, hold on, what is going on here? And like that. And do I need some help? Get that holistic look. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at the time and I'm looking out the, uh, the door here. I think there's a couple of faces yeah, that are yeah. uh, waiting on us. Is there anything else we should say before we wrap up? Uh, again, just 
plug in uh, the BDT Range Day tomorrow uh, yep. at Range Langley. Uh, we hope, you know, any, any serving, retired, military, law enforcement, first responder, uh, it's a lot, you know, we want you to come out. It's a free event or anything like that. You come out, you shoot a bunch of our guns. It's free ammo. Yeah. There'll be free food there. And we just, we want you to come out and have a good day. Um, thank you for Range Langley to, uh, putting on, the agreeing to put on the event for us, all their staff and Andrew, uh, Taft there like that. That's yeah. willing to support us. Um, and honestly, I just want to say thank you to yourself and having me on. This is, uh, this is my first experience really kind of on a podcast. It's been honestly a great one. Oh, you're a natural. Uh, you're a natural. I, I, I appreciate that. You're going to have your own show. I can see it already. Uh, I don't know about that, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, gotta get past daycare first. Like that. And then I maybe can afford some of this equipment, but, uh, but no, it's, it's been a, it's been a really, really good, uh, experience. Um, you're, you're a great interviewer or like that. You kind of just let us kind of talk or like that. And it's, uh, there's therapy in that in itself. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast.